Well, welcome everybody to uh, today's uh, Kinder Institute Colloquium. I'm uh, Jeff Pasley, uh, Associate Director of the Kinder Institute, and we are uh, uh, this. We're glad here today to have two scholars who epitomize what we try to do here. And indeed, we're uh, in, in in the sense that they are uh, scholars, pol political science-based scholars who uh, speak to historians and uh, and and. And vice versa, which is indeed part of part of why I'm. Uh, uh, we usually have we usually have the historians introduce the historians, uh, and the political scientists introduce the political scientists. And today we're crossing it up, though it'll be apparent why uh, the why why in, in a second. I think. Uh, so today we're talking about uh, James Madison, and we're, this is a very long planned event. I think it was originally planned for February 2020. I think. Uh, the, the, mm -hmm. I may have the month slightly wrong, and we had to cancel it one time last year, like everything else was canceled, and we're holding out to have it in person, uh, but decided that uh, we just we wanted to go ahead and get it in this year, before, even before uh, we were allowed to do the in-person event. So, so we're welcome, Alan Gibson and uh, Michael Zucker. And what I'm going to do is. Uh, Introduce introduce both of them uh, in the kind of reverse order they're going to speak, and then uh, and then the two of them will will uh, give their talks, and then we'll have our usual uh, Q and A where uh, people we we'll invite invite you anytime during the talk to submit questions in the chat, and then uh, after when we get to the Q and A section, uh, we will actually call you up and have you uh, have you ask your questions. Uh, we'll will call on you and you'll get on and ask the questions directly rather than having uh, someone read read your question. Uh, so we can then have an actual discussion uh, that we like to have. So uh, Al Gibson uh, is currently, he's, a, he's, he's technically currently a distinguished visiting research fellow at the Kinder Institute, but he's going to be joining us actually permanently next year after retiring from Cal State Chico, where he's taught uh, for many years. Uh, and he's actually been, uh, has already been a, a, a fellow here uh, and is currently doing it long distance, but he'll be coming back to Columbia and being with us, being with us uh, full time for the foreseeable future. So we're actually glad to welcome Alan Gibson in more ways than one. Uh, Alan's, uh, Alan's focus is American political thought, especially in the founding, and he's had many different fellowships, including uh, uh, from the International Center for Jefferson Studies, the James Madison Program in American Ideals at Princeton, and the NEH. Published all kinds of articles, but his main his main work is two books, and this is see, this is what I mean by epitomizing the work of the Kinder Institute. Alan is a political scientist who's written books about the history about about historiography. Uh, so actually writes on historians, which is an unusual, unusual thing, especially on the historiography of the American founding, but two books both published by the University Press of Kansas. He's, uh, he's currently working on a book, on the, on, not surprisingly, I guess, on the study of the political thought of James Madison that's tentatively entitled James Madison and the Creation of an Impartial Republic. Uh, so Alan Gibson will be speaking second today. Uh, opening up today is going to be uh, Michael Zuckert, who uh, is the Nancy R. Drew Professor of Political Scientist Emeritus at, at the University of Notre Dame. And I just learned the Thomas R. Smith Dis Dis Distinguished Visiting Professor at the University of Arizona in uh, the school of, I got to put this in a different part of my introduction notes, which are, are so long that I can't see where the school of Arizona, Arizona State, excuse me, excuse me, Arizona State School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership. Uh, Michael is the author and editor of what I think is safe to say uh, is a voluminous corpus of writings on political thought and constitutional studies. Uh, and he, among his many other scholarly accomplishments is one of our greatest interpreters of the American founding. And uh, I mean, this is true of both Alan and Michael, but I think Michael particularly is, uh, 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 has, has the rare, you know, is rare in, the, in, in, in being read and 
highly read and respected across disciplinary bound across the usual disciplinary boundaries of political science, law, and history. Uh, and I guess I'll especially say from the history side that historians are, are often not very prone uh, to be re to read uh, political theorists or scholars of political thought. But Michael is an exception is a, a major exception to that. Uh, his books include Natural Rights and the New Republicanism, The Natural Rights Republic, uh, Launching Liberalism, and uh, with Catherine Zuckert, uh, two books about, uh, uh, about Leo Strauss, The Truth About Leo Strauss, and Leo Strauss and the Problem of Political Philosophy, about the great, though controversial and often misunderstood political theorist with whom Michael studied at the University of Chicago. And here I must note for some of our students and colleagues that Michael is then a leading Midwest Straussian. Uh, since we've often we've we've often discussed the different the different, the different divisions uh, uh, or or uh, whatever nicer word I, I should use. Um, in uh, is after various speakers over the years, uh, and that's in addition to many many articles and edited works, including I guess because I know uh, his co-editor is 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 here with us today. I will mention. Uh, the Legal Commonplace Book of Thomas Jefferson, part of the official uh, papers of Thomas Jefferson, uh, which he co-edited with uh, our friend Davis, David Thomas Koenig of Washington University. Uh, Mike was also one of the founding editors of the journal American Political Thought, published by the University of Chicago Press. And among his just many other, I mean, he's a man of many, many parts. Also had a, had a, had a period where he was doing lots of things for on public radio and television. Uh, uh, co-authored a public radio series but the, the, uh, based on the Adams Jefferson letters uh, uh, back a while back and then was the sort of senior scholarly advisor for a series of PBS documentaries that many of you may have seen including Liberty exclamation point from 97 and then two uh, different about the revolution and then uh, other later ones on Ben Franklin and Alexander Hamilton though unfortunately he didn't had, doesn't have the most famous uh, production on Alexander Hamilton uh, that's ever been done. <laughs> right. Though I'm sure it was an influence. I don't know, maybe he can add, maybe, 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 maybe he's probably in there somewhere. Um, so let me just say, I'm sorry to just go on for so long. Uh, Michael, uh, someone I've, uh, has a, has a, a very, very, uh, very, very uh, uh, important role actually in my, in my, in my, the life of myself and my family as in he's kind of like responsible for my family existing. Uh, so therefore, uh, therefore I, I feel like I have to, I have to mention that my favorite part of Michael's career uh, that I say for last uh, because it had the most impact on me is, uh, uh, is he and his wife, Catherine taught for many years at Carleton College, where he was just simply one of the greatest teachers I ever encountered and the greatest intellectuals I ever encountered, the most appealing ones. Uh, the kind of teacher who could who might cause some random history major to take like five or six classes, often on topics that I really had no idea I was interested in. Uh, and probably were more interesting when he talked about them than anyone else, to be, to be fair, in some cases, but in other cases, uh, stayed around permanently. Uh, I'd been planning to go to law school, I think, and but the, the Zuckerts made academic life look so appealing uh, uh, that you just couldn't help but want to do what they did. And every class was such so fun and stimulating and, uh, and you, that you didn't want to stop talking about it. And you didn't even care that ancient, ancient and medieval political philosophy only got to medieval on the last day. Uh, uh, like Thomas Aquinas, as I recall. <laughs> That's actually the class that I, that I met my wife in. So, so therefore, uh, I've been carrying around that class uh, for ever since then. Um, and while I didn't end up going into the Zuckert's field exactly, the spirit of inquiry and of following ideas wherever they led, however long it took, was always uh, the one that I wanted to foster and recreate whatever I, wherever I was. And, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of Michael and many other, this and many other ways in a lot of things we do at the Kinder Institute, too. Uh, so it's so great to have him here, and uh, I wish we get. I hope we get to host him in person again sometime soon. Uh, I some, 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 so hope we get to hope to do person again sometime. Host him in person again sometime soon, and I'd like to turn it over now to Michael Zuckert if I can get my phone to stop ringing. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Jeff. I 
I always dread introductions like that because they uh, raise expectations and make yeah, it difficult no, right. You're to in trouble now. live up to them. So well, I'm going to do the best I can. That, that cut it. <laughs> I was just expecting a much more mediocre introduction. So <laughs> anyway, <laughs> no, I, I want to say just to return the uh, return some of the uh, some of the honor. Uh, Jeff was a student of mine, as he indicated, and was indeed one of the very best students I've ever ever. I had the pleasure of teaching. So uh, those of you who have him now as a teacher, I, I, I'm, I'm sure that's a great experience for you. In any case, uh, to get to the topic, my topic is slavery and the Constitution viewed in a Madisonian perspective. And I'm going to begin by just mentioning the various debates over the founders and slavery that have roiled academic and political waters since the mid 20th century. I'm not going to go into any detail on those, but I'm going to say just to begin that the two main antagonists in those battles can plausibly be called neo Garrisonians and neo Lincolnians. After William Lloyd Garrison, the famous abolitionist, and after Abraham Lincoln, of course. Today, these two schools have been reborn as partisans of 1619 and partisans of 1776 as the most significant benchmark dates in American history. So the debates between these two schools concern two issues in the main, I'd say. First, how favorable was the Constitution towards slavery? And the second concerns the motives upon which the founding generation acted. The Neo-Garrisonians answer the first set of questions rather straightforwardly. The Constitution was very favorable to the institution of slavery and gave it a great deal of life-sustaining aid. The Neo-Lincolnians on the other side while conceding that the Constitution did indeed make some accommodations to slavery, they deny that these were nearly as substantial as the Neo-Garrisonians claim. The Neo-Garrisonians answer the second set of questions by arguing that the founders were moved by the same complex of motives that uh, led to the uh, uh, flourishing of the institution of slavery in the first place. Greed, racism, Christian triumphalism and moral indifference being among the chief items on that list. The Neo-Lincolnians, on the other hand, argued that the place of slavery in the constitutional order was due primarily to the press of necessity, that without concessions to slavery, the union would not have been possible. The Neo-Lincolnians furthermore frequently point to the expectation or at least the hope among the founders that the process of abolition in the states that had begun during the revolution would continue until slavery had been removed from the land. As Lincoln himself put it, the founders lived in the expectation of the ultimate extinction of slavery. Now these scholarly debate, debates can be very, very heated. Indeed, the topic is so controversial that the partisans of the different positions can't even agree on how many parts of the constitution are actually relevant to slavery. Um, the neo, one, one neo Garrisonian found in the Constitution 18 clauses supportive of slavery. The neo Lincolnians find far fewer, basically, the three most uh, obvious ones the three fifths formula for representation and direct taxation, the slave trade clause, and the fugitive slave clause. Paul Finkelman, a uh, leading neo Garrisonian, distinguishes between direct and indirect aids to slavery in the Constitution. In the former group, he would include, for example, the Fugitive Slave Clause, protecting slave owners from losing runaways who make it into free states. An example of the latter would be the Insurrection Clause, which empowered the federal government to come to the aid of any state suffering an insurrection. Finkelman's classification, I think, is helpful, but I would add to it a distinction between constitutional clauses specifically tailored to accommodate the presence of slavery and provisions that most likely would have been in the Constitution, even if there were no enslaved persons in North America. The Insurrection Clause, I think, is an example of the latter, because that was a staple of federal theory in the founding era, that this was one of the advantages of federal systems. It's, for example, spoken of uh, at length by Montesquieu. Many, if not all, of the indirect aids to slavery are, I think, of this kind. 
On the preliminary question of how many parts of the Constitution bear on slavery, I think we need to be a little more refined than the neo-Garrisonians often are. To say that various provisions of the Constitution might aid slavery indirectly does not establish that aiding slavery was the aim or even the expected long-term consequence of that, of that constitutional order. It would be perfectly compatible with the neo-Garrisonian indirect aids for the founders to have aimed and expected to see slavery undone in the medium range future. So many generally neutral provisions or indirect aids um, may prove to be protective of slavery, but this true observation perhaps proves too much. The Constitution as a whole, if successful in providing peace, security, stability, prosperity, the things they were aiming at, would tend to provide support for any and all practices that were in institutions that were part of the established status quo within the states. Thus, we could increase the neo-Garrisonian tally substantially if we use the test of aid and support to include everything in the Constitution. The neo-Garrisonians also do not credit sufficiently the refusal of the text's drafters to include the word slavery and slave in it as something that they considered blameworthy and a blemish that they hoped could be removed. James Madison, for example, said at the Constitutional Convention that he, he thought it wrong to admit in the Constitution the idea that there could be property in men. In order to avoid so admitting that the constitutional text deploys awkward circumlocutions so that the first appearance of the word slavery in the document appears only in the 13th Amendment's prohibition of that institution in the United States. The account of motives given by the Neo-Garrisonians comports too little with the embarrassed efforts at circumlocution that mark the text. But the Neo-Lincolnians also overshoot. The founders more easily accepted slavery supporting provisions like the Fugitive Slave Clause than they needed to. Nobody threatened to leave the Union if that clause had not been included. It is true that the delegates accepted several clauses recognizing and in some measure furthering the institution. Probably most significant though was the dog that didn't bark. Nobody stood up to demand that the Constitution contain provisions prohibiting or the Congress be empowered to prohibit slavery in the states. The Neo-Lincolnians are correct to note much, much distaste, even repugnance for slavery at the Constitutional Convention, but their case for concessions under duress is not, as Finkelman and others show, entirely compelling. As a first step toward understanding the meaning of the slavery provisions in the Constitution, I think we need to ascend to a somewhat more general level than the specific constitutional clauses and instead take our bearings from the two largest facts about slavery in the Constitution. First, the aforementioned failure even to contemplate a power in the US government to deal with slavery in the states. And the other aforementioned fact that the words slave and slavery nowhere appear but are replaced, as I say, with these awkward circumlocutions. The existence of slavery was accepted, but not endorsed. It was, an accepted, it was accepted as an institution of the states that chose to have it, as the specific constitutional clauses dealing with it made clear. The Fugitive Slave Clause very carefully and deliberately described the slaves as persons held to service or labor in one state under the laws thereof. Stephen Douglas, surprisingly, is a good witness to the meaning of a fugitive slave clause. In a speech in 1859, he explicated the clause in a way that highlights the relationship between slavery and the Constitution. Now, he said, by the express provisions of that clause of the Constitution, a slave is a person held to service or labor in one state under the laws thereof, not under the Constitution of the United States, not under the laws of the United States or by virtue of any federal authority, but in a state under the laws thereof. The Slave Trade Clause spoke of this trade as involving such persons as any of the states now existing shall think proper to admit. States that had slavery were not for that reason considered 
unsuitable partners for the union. <clears throat> I'm sorry, but the Constitution is very careful not to endorse the institution or make the slavery, the institution of slavery, its own. The text does not support Chief, Tawney's view, Chief Justice Tawney's view in the infamous Dred Scott case that the Constitution explicitly recognizes and affirms slavery, nor does it support the neo garrisonian view that it was a pro-slavery compact. But neither does it declare war on slavery or commit to ending the practice. To understand the constitutional settlement, we need to look at it with the eyes of 1787 and not those of 1857 or 2027. In making the constitution, the framers were making a federation. That is to say what the French philosopher Montesquieu called a society of societies, a union of otherwise independent political units. William Wiesek, the historian, got it right when he said that nearly all the 55 delegates who arrived in Philadelphia in 1787 shared the common assumption that slavery as such had no place in the deliberations there because it was a domestic institution of the states, no different from such things as marriage or ecclesiastical governance, something rather exclusively within the responsibility of the states. That was Wiesek. That in itself made the largest fact about the constitutional settlement regarding slavery nearly inevitable. That is to say, the failure of the constitution to say or do anything about slavery within the states. Moreover, the new constitution was not a mere reprise of traditional federalism. The Americans under the leadership of James Madison revolutionized the principles of federal design by relating the government of the union directly to its individual human citizens and not merely to its member governments as had been federal practice in the past. That meant that the government of the union intruded far more deeply into the internal life of the member states than any historic federation had ever done. A precondition for that unprecedented degree of union intrusion, however, was a very clear line of demarcation between matters of concern to the government of the union and matters of concern to the states. The vehicle by which this was accomplished was the enumerated powers. The general principle behind the enumeration was the idea characteristic of traditional federalism. Matters of internal governance are, with a few exceptions, not matters of concern for the government of the Union. The American order was innovative also in committing itself to a republicanism that reduced, that reinforced, I should say, the commitment to the internal autonomy of the states. Republicanism means, at a minimum, self-government each unit should be a self-governing entity, which means that in matters concerning itself, other political units should not be making decisions for it. Thus, the commitments to federal union and republicanism converged to guarantee that matters like slavery would be regarded as state institutions largely outside the purview of the government of the union. Nevertheless, slavery was not in fact left merely as an internal matter for the member states. In at least th three well-known places in the Constitution, some national account was taken of the institution. Slavery may be a state institution, but there were some matters where it spilled over necessarily into the Union and constitutional provision had to be made for it. That provision was more readily forthcoming than the neo-Lincolnians admit, but less pro-slavery, I believe, than the Neo-Garrisonians assert. Take the Fugitive Slave Clause, which provided that a slave escaping into another state shall not become free by virtue of being in free territory, but will, but will be returned to his or her owner as established by the laws of the slave state's origin. To have the kind of union the Americans sought, that is to say a huge free trade, free trade area meant having open borders between the states and therefore a porousness that makes slave escape much easier than would otherwise be. Now in a federation, one should attempt to avoid as far as possible, obvious sources of friction between member states. 
If slaves could escape with relative ease into free states across open borders, then there was surely would be frictions among the states. Thus, the convention had no difficulty accommodating the slave states on the matter of fugitives. The Fugitive Slave Clause is not then a constitutional endorsement of slavery beyond that already noted constitutional principle that, that the existing state republics were free within the union to order themselves internally, including free to keep the slavery that they had. The Fugitive Slave Clause's drafters went far out of their way to emphasize that slavery was a state institution under state law and accommodation of it was a matter of comity among the states. It was not a constitutional endorsement of slavery, but contrary to the thrust of neo-Lincolnian thinking, the clause did represent a degree of toleration toward the institution. The constitution thus accepts slavery as a fact, character, as a fact characterizing some of the member units and makes an accommodation to that fact so far as there are spillover effects into the union. It is at most a stance of neutrality toward an institution some members had, but others did not. The other crucial fact, the unwillingness even to speak the name of the practice to make sure that it is identified entirely as a practice of the states, points to a distinct lack of neutrality. If the constitution were truly neutral or supportive towards slavery, it would show no aversion to naming the institution. Consider the constitution of the Confederate States of America. It showed no such shyness about speaking openly of the peculiar institution. Indeed, it prohibited any of the member states from abolishing slavery. That is what a real pro-slavery constitution looks like. Moreover, the constitutional provisions regarding slavery must be, must be viewed against the backdrop of so much of the rest of the political climate of the day. The colonies acting together to declare their independence had expressed a theory of legitimacy, which nearly all members of that generation understood to be contrary to the institution of slavery. Thus, William Wiesek speaks of, quote, the widespread and heartfelt opposition to slavery expressed by so many of the framers. He endorses as doubtless correct the tendency of those neo-Lincolnian historians in ascribing anti-slavery sentiment to most of them. Nearly all the new states adopted constitutions reaffirming those same principles of legitimacy. During the founding era, many of the new states acted on the perceived incompatibility between the received principles of legitimacy and slavery and moved to abolish the practice. In the states that did not do so, there were strong currents of sentiment to follow the example of the others. Where slavery was retained, the most common defense was the plea of necessity, not the plea that slavery was inherently right or legitimate. Now that changed later in the 19th century, but at the time of the founding, that was so. I rehearsed these familiar facts in order to propose a formula for the place of slavery in the constitution that was neither Garrisonian nor Neo-Lincolnian Within the constitutional order, slavery was legal, but not legitimate. It was legal within the member states and to a degree within the constitution itself, where it spilled over the borders of the member states and impinged on the union. It was not legitimate because the founding generation accepted a theory of political right as expressed in the Declaration of Independence and similar documents that was incompatible with slavery. But the principle of legitimacy that they accepted did not penetrate or inform the entire political system. It was in this sense an incomplete constitution. It is not that the constitution gave no aid to slavery as an institution, but nothing the constitutional framers did was incompatible with the hope, which Neil Lincolnians discern, that the slave that the institution would ultimately pass away. My point is a relatively narrow, but I think an important one. The constitution did indeed give slavery a place in the established legality, but the institution remained outside the broader consensus on the basic principles of legitimacy upon which the constitution was erected. Now it is problematic for any political or legal system to live with the kind of disparity between legality and legitimacy that marked the American order. Any political community 
experiencing such a disparity is subject to great pressures to bring legality and legitimacy into greater harmony with each other. As Lincoln said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. The antebellum period was indeed deeply marked by the tensions resulted from that disparity between legality and legitimacy. And over time, that disparity proved more and more difficult to live with. Now, three kinds of responses arose during the ante antebellum era. And as they interacted with each other, the rift became ever greater and more intense. One response was to attempt to make, to make legality so as to cohere with legitimacy. Such was the approach of the various sorts of abolitionists. A second response was to remake legitimacy to match the otherwise anomalous legality of slavery. Such were the efforts of such men as John C. Calhoun, Alexander Stevens, and the entire slavery as a positive good school. And finally, there were efforts to creatively maintain the tension so as to preserve the original defective and incomplete but established constitutional order. Supreme Court Justices Joseph Story and Benjamin Curtis were two who tried this path. The strain caused by the diremption between legality and legitimacy proved too great for the political system to weather, however. The result was the Civil War, which in theory settled the issue by in the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the Constitution, but in practice left the issue to fester for another 160 years and counting. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Uh, over to you, Alan. And um, I'm just going to, Alan, I'm just going to say, sorry, the, the introduction, uh, I'll have many other uh, opportunities to introduce you in the future, I, I hope so. So, so I'll, I'll, I'll write, I'll write the, the, introdu the introduction. Uh, in you, you, you did a wonderful job. I, I'm, I'm very pleased with that. Um, anyway, I, I want to thank the Kinder Institute generally for um, the possibility of working for you in the, in, in the future. I, I'm honored to have this appointment. Uh, it's something I've looked up for for a long time in my career, and um, hopefully it will be fruitful uh, on both ends. I'm, I'm really looking forward to, uh, to becoming a permanent part of the faculty there. Um, I've, I've gone through several versions of this. Uh, I first thought of, the, of doing something just called the prescient um, mind of James Madison, because I've seen all of these instances where certain observations Madison made have been reaffirmed by um, sort of uh, behavioral uh, and uh, psychologists, by uh, uh, our choice architecture people, by systems theory people and things like that. I'm gonna mention some of these things along the way. And I just thought about just talking about how Madison was uh, such a smart guy and such a, uh, um, a forward looking one. Um, that seemed a bit shallow, and so I, uh, I decided to turn it into a, a slightly different uh, kind of endeavor. And what I'm going to be looking at today is to use the case of the extended republic uh, to examine Madison's methodology and how Madison thought um, sort of out of the box in order to challenge the prevailing orthodoxy about the small republic theory. So I'm going to use the small republic theory um, as an instance of Madison thinking his way outside of conventional assumptions. Um, Madison also had novel conceptions of separation of powers and federalism. No one's done better work on that than uh, Michael Zuckard. Um, and so you can do, apply these same kinds of observations to that. Um, but um, I'm, I'm gonna stick to the extended republic if I, if I get there. I really have a, a, a lot of these slides. I don't know if, uh, how far I'm going to go. I'm going to go for about 30 minutes here and then, uh, uh, and then stop and find, a, find a, uh, the right way to stop. So at any rate, if you go through the, the some 60 odd character sketches of James Madison provided by his contemporaries and John Kamenetsky's illuminating collection, The Founders on the Founders, these are character sketches by a certain founders of James Madison, contemporaries of him. Um, at any rate, the, the overriding sentiment uh, of, about James Madison, the thing that comes vividly through, actually two things come vividly through, um, his contemporaries talk about his timidity, his shyness, uh, and they also talk about his studious and scholarly character. Um, this observation 
is often unambiguously intended as a compliment. Uh, so when William Pierce famously characterized Madison as blending together the profound politician with the scholar, he, he was making a, a positive turn on this. Um, it was somehow, sometimes however proposed to suggest that Madison was deficient in practical knowledge and worldly affairs. Uh, so Fisher Ames took a number of shots at James Madison as a book politician. Um, he, he says he, had, he was composed too much rather of theory. Um, either way, uh, subsequent and subsequent scholars of course have, have fastened directly onto this. Um, everyone has appreciated Madison's native intelligence his analytical altitude, and the depth, diligence, and profundity of his approach uh, to addressing political problems and understanding them. This presentation and the essay that uh, result from it uh, plums this familiar portrait toward a better understanding of what might be called a Madisonian methodology and the relationship of that methodology to Madison's most important contributions in political architecture, especially his theory of an extended republic. My, my goal is not to simply reaffirm and solidify Madison's already fixed place as the most cerebral and bookish of the founders, nor is it merely to amplify or refine recent and not so recent scholarship that has explored the character of Madisonian political thinking and the sources of Madison's genius and creativity as a political thinker. My goals are additionally to examine the systematic character of Madison's genius and creativity, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the systematic character of Madison's preparations and the assumptions underlying his approach to solving problems, to call attention to several, um, uh, to call attention to several remarkably prescient observations that his approach and his keen powers of observation yielded and to explore how he then applied these insights into the construction of his singular, his signature in innovations in constitutional theory, especially his theory of an extended republic. As a thinking revolutionary, Madison analyzed the deep structure of existing political systems, exposing the logic of their operations through an analysis of the incentive structure within them. He simultaneously engaged in comparative analogic historical analysis and drew upon his concrete political experience to propose several robust observations about individual and group behavior and different political systems. And he proposed these as axioms of political science. Those who've read Madison know he tends to speak in large generalizations very often as if these are propositions or laws of political science that, he's, that he is talking about. Um, Madison's application or methodology, I'm sorry, also included the concrete application of these axioms and findings within the novel context of the American continent based upon a keen awareness of the problems the peculiar genius of the American people posed, but also the opportunities that the uniqueness of America opened. Focusing on Madison as a prescient thinking revolution thus provides a window into Madison's revolutionary thinking especially his novel contributions in constitutional architecture. Um, just to, to add a couple of, uh, of, uh, of details to the goals that I have of this, uh, one of them is to, uh, is to look at four common ways of analyzing Madison's political thinking and his political thought and propose an alternative that rejects one of them pretty much wholesale, but that, that integrates the very real insights uh, within the others. Um, progressive historians still tend to, to treat Madison's bookish habits, his, his propensity for ideas, those kinds of things, um, as if they don't exist or, or had no influence. Uh, I, I, I really like Woody Holton's work uh, on the American founding in a number of different ways, but Holton basically dismisses Madison's readings before the Constitutional Convention, his famous readings in which he received a cargo of books from, from Thomas Jefferson, his so-called literary cargo. He basically says Madison would have come to those conclusions whether or not he read those books or not. He had already come to the conclusion of what was necessary for constitutional reform, what he wanted um, and what the problems were. Uh, I just don't agree with that. And I'll, I'll explain some why in the future. Um, I also want to transcend a borrowings or influence approach 
um, to uh, looking at Madison's political thought. It's not that that's not important. I, I do very much think that Madison was influenced to a degree uh, by David Hume, who is the, uh, the person that's most frequently said to have influenced Madison's political thinking. I think you can chart direct relationships between some of, uh, of Hume's observations and some of Madison's thinking on these, these topics, uh, especially the topic of the extended republic. But I seem to think that has been overdone. It also opens up the, uh, the, the, the uh, scholarship to this kind of uh, endless cascade of uh, this person had this nuanced uh, understanding of this and, and influenced him. And this person has this other nuanced understanding of this. This has gone on, uh, as, as many of you know, with regards to the Declaration of Independence as, as well as, the, uh, as Madison's political thought. Um, but Douglas Adair is the person who, who first focused upon Hume, uh, and he said that Madison probably had Hume opened up uh, next to him when he wrote the 10 Federalist Papers, something along those lines. I think, I think that overdoes it. I think it overstates it. Uh, and I think it's um, it, Madison's uh, theory of the extended republic is born, I'm going to argue, in a concrete problem-solving activity. And then intellectual influences feed back into uh, his resolution, his, his understanding and his craft uh, um, of, uh, of that theory. Um, another thing that I'm going to try to, uh, uh, to take on to some degree at least um, is Jack Rakoff's recent study, uh, A Politician Thinking the Creative Mind of James Madison. Um, Rakoff says in this, Madison's political ideas were first and foremost a response to events in which he participated. I think that's true to some degree. I don't know about, but I think that uh, Jack writes out Madison's historical studies uh, from this. He doesn't, he provides a profound analysis of vices of the political system in the United States, but notes on Confederation and Madison's studies, and especially the assumptions underlying those studies, the scientific Scottish Enlightenment idea that mankind is the same in all places and all times, and therefore uh, that you need to study ancient confederations in order to understand the principles. Madison is, is looking during those studies for nothing less than a science of federal government, as he the phrase he uses in the Federalist number 18. Uh, and so, um, Jack Rakoff's study is, is, is full of insight. I, I do not want to uh, criticize it or, or, or take a, um, a distance from it that I don't have. You'll see me actually using it some um, in what I'm presenting. Um, but, but to some degree, I, I see limitations in it as well. And then finally, there's the Skinner School of Interpretation that suggests that Madison could not really have addressed a perennial problem in the history of political thought with his theory of the extended republic because no such problems exist. Um, there are no perennial problems. Um, and Madison proceeded as if there were. He may have been deluded, uh, but he lined up things as if, uh, uh, as if ancient and modern confederations uh, uh, had, it, it was worthy to study both equally. He didn't, uh, he didn't, in other words, establish that the past is such a foreign nation that we can't learn from it. He drew direct lessons from history, um, as I'll talk about more in, in, in just a minute. The final thing um, is that uh, I'm going to talk about uh, archival activities as a part of Madison's methodology. So I think Madison's I'm going to systematize to some degree Madison's methodology. And in doing this, this provides a challenge to Mary Builder's claim that Madison took notes of the debates in the Confederation Congress of 1782 and 1783, and then 1787. And then later, of course, his famous note taking in the Constitutional Convention. She says that those were done uh, as a part of a legislative diary. That's how she describes the form that Madison used. Um, and she says that Madison's purposes were almost entirely particular and strategic. Um, this uh, So he was trying to, to uh, provide himself with a record in order to trace allies and opponents at, at the at Congress and at the Constitutional Convention. And he was also, um, according to Builder, uh, trying to write a record for Jefferson, who was going to want an account of those proceedings. I don't reject the idea that Madison could have had strategic purposes. 
uh, for keeping a, the notes of the Constitutional Convention. It, it, he, those, uh, what Mary Builder calls his motives for, uh, for taking notes, I see as the effect of them. He, he sharpened his own thinking. He knew about his political opponents better. He became the so-called best informed man at the Constitutional Convention as a result of, uh, in part, of taking uh, uh, notes at the convention. But Madison also claimed to have been taking a record for posterity. And I think I can convince you that in fact, he was by virtue of his archival activities at this time period, which included taking notes as part of a general civil history of America during this time period. And this is what I'm incidentally most excited about, about this research. It's the thing that is most novel about it. So sequentially, and we'll see how far I get, uh, what does a Madisonian methodology look like? What results did it yield in terms of uh, specifically of, uh, of scientific propositions about politics? And, and then how did those scientific propositions about politics uh, inform Madison's thinking about a theory of an extended republic and uh, spark it? So anyway, this goes all the way back to 1780, Madison's methodology does. Um, he enters Congress, uh, the Confederation Congress in 1780. Um, he starts to take his seat and lo and behold, he gets snowed in at Montpelier um, for a, a relatively long period of time. Uh, in, he uses this time to study the issue of money in, pu uh, in public finance. Um, he really is studying uh, what gives money its value, um, and he's trying to, uh, to figure out uh, the factors that condition the value of money. He writes two essays. Uh, they are entitled Money. They're included, incidentally, in volume uh, one of the Madison papers and not, uh, and not in the, uh, the, uh, the later volumes of the Madison papers under his National Gazette essays, but it's his National Gazette essays where they're published a, a, a decade later uh, after this. Incidentally, those people who think that Madison is fundamentally inconsistent in his political thought face the barrier of the fact that Madison writes these two uh, essays in 1780 and then feels very comfortable publishing them in 1790 as the same foundation for his thoughts on public finance, which is a huge issue, of course, during this time period. Madison is brought to this topic, incidentally, because um, the continental currency has recently been devalued, I think to 300 to one or something like that. They're basically starting all over again with the value of, uh, of, of their currency during this time period. Uh, Madison's about to enter Congress. He wants to be informed about this. What does he do? He, he investigates the history of, uh, of money and what gives it value. He turns to Hume, incidentally, there a great deal as well. And he really is trying to look for the underlying uh, uh, prime mover or central factor controlling the value of money. Madison does, does research also, of course, on the effects of religious establishments. He does this uh, kinds of historical research. Uh, this is all very important. His, his research on the confederations, uh, ancient and modern, is going to be something I talk about several times in there. This is the, uh, the research that results from the literary cargo that he gets from Jefferson in 1786. Um, and this is, his, is probably his most uh, important historical study. Um, Douglas Dare said it was the most fruitful uh, piece of historical research ever done by an American. Um, and he also, uh, and, and not until 1790 incidentally, researches directly the relationship of size uh, and republicanism in states. So he looks at Plato and Aristotle uh, and any number of different thinkers in his uh, so-called notes on government. Um, so what does the, what does the Madisonian uh, uh, methodology look like generally when it's applied to these kinds of things? First, it includes a structural or systems diagnosis, a diagnosis that identifies the central or controlling factor causing a political problem uh, and also analyzing the logic or incentive structure of a system. Madison is engaged in system diagnosis. 
So this is one of the things that I fastened on to about the prescient mind of James Madison. Uh, I'm reading, um, I, was, I was reading uh, how, why we're polarized by Ezra Klein, who in turn uh, quotes um, a systems thinker named Decker, I've forgotten his first name, I actually have it in the notes uh, later on, uh, who, who is talking about the anal uh, uh, analyzing things in terms of systems theory. Uh, well, system theory suggests that you don't just look for a broken part, you look at a logic or a, an incentive structure in something, um, and you don't assume um, that by fixing one part, you're necessarily going to change the whole. You have to um, you have to grasp the underlying rationale, in effect, of the system in order to hope to um, to change it. A second component of Madisonian methodology is analogical comparative empirical study of, uh, of American and historical precedents, ancient and modern. Madison always proceeds to look at what American experience has been on a particular issue, then British experience, and then the experience uh, of all peoples anywhere he can find it. He's a huge reader of histories, uh, and, and we'll see uh, in a minute, he, he wants to even write one himself at one time, uh, possibly. Anyway, um, this analogic comparative empirical study is the thing that Douglas Adair fastened on to more than any other scholar. And I think um, he's the one who really captures what Madison was trying to do there, which is really to develop a science of politics, a true science of politics. And so what Madison is, is trying to do uh, in these studies is based upon the premise that mankind is the same in all places at all times. Um, therefore, what you do is you look at how um, different cultural assumptions, different organizational patterns uh, have affected behavior in different places across the world at different times. And then you try to isolate what is causing something, but your underlying assumption is that man mankind is the same. Men are going to be motivated by the same things in all times and all places. Uh, Madison says at the Constitutional Convention several times, and other people say the same thing, uh, the same causes always produce the same effects. Uh, uh, John Dickinson very famously uh, says, experience must be our only guide, reason will mislead us. What he means by that, by experience, is the spirit, it's not just the immediate experience of the Americans, he means the experience of mankind. Um, and Adair showed all that in his, uh, in his studies. Uh, Madison also engages, and this is somewhat uh, separate, but I think also uh, linked to um, uh, the uh, analogical comparative empirical studies. He engages in intensive readings on problems. Um, the thing that he engages in a reading on in 1782 is he engages in a course of law reading. Now, Madison has been said uh, by some scholars to have been contemplating practicing law at this time period. So he was at a, uh, at a kind of transitional point in his political career in 1783, 1784. If you remember the Articles of Confederation provisions, you only got to serve three years. He starts in 1780. He's gonna be term limited out in 1783 84, right around that time period. He actually ends up spending a couple of months more than uh, three years in, in uh, the Confederation Congress or the Continental Congress then. Um, at any rate, he, um, he's thinking about what he wants to do. He wants to avoid an occupation, incidentally, that is dependent upon the labor of slaves. He says so directly, um, but he also says directly during this time period, 1783, he doesn't want to be a lawyer. He doesn't like what lawyers do. He thinks it's boring. Uh, he thinks it's, uh, he says, he basically says, I don't want to do the activities that would be required of me if I became a lawyer. So I don't know why people think that uh, during this, this reading time, he was uh, engaged in a course for actually vo uh, choosing a, a vocation. Uh, what he's really doing in, in studying law is he's studying international law and the public law of uh, different nations around the world. So he's engaged still in this uh, comparative historical kind of analysis. But what he's also doing is preparing himself for service in the, uh, the Confederation Congress. 
the uh, the task of the Confederation of Congress again, if you remember the Arts Confederation, it is mostly executive functions that are taking place um, by the people who are congressmen at this time period. period. Um, and so it is studying international relations and interstate relations that he's doing through a comparative study of of law. He uh, he stays interested in this topic. Um, this reading course of reading, incidentally, is, I think, feeds directly into his study of ancient confederations. People often say Madison got serious about studying confederations in 1786, 1787, when, he found, when Jefferson finally delivered the books he wanted. But Madison was actually engaged in this study from 1782 forward uh, of, of the public law of different nations and international law. You can see this incidentally also um, in the uh, book list that James Madison makes out for Congress. Madison is a very diffident guy, of course. He's a, he's a shy guy and everything like that, but that doesn't take away um, any uh, lack of confidence in some ways uh, from his observations. And one of his observations is, um, that there are a defect of adequate statesmen. That's a quote um, in the Confederation Congress. He says this is a very young man entering uh, the Confederation or the Continental Congress. He says it's full of a defect of adequate statesmen. Um, so he wants to provide a library for Congress. So the Library of Congress results from a library intended for congressmen from James Madison. And um, he, um, he seconds a motion uh, to buy books for this. He creates a reading list. It has some 550 different titles, about 1,300 volumes in it. Uh, he's, um, he's not, I wouldn't say derivative of a similar list from Jefferson, but he utilizes a similar list from Jefferson. Um, and he... Uh, um, uh, he, he comes up with the, the titles he wants. He, this is really, really long list. The first heading on it, incidentally, is the law of nature and nations uh, or something like that. Uh, and then if you go forward, um, you see in the middle sections, he deals with classic political theory is, uh, 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 books and things like that. Um, at any rate, uh, it is indicative of what he is doing that he's engaged in this um, extensive uh, uh, reading. The committee incidentally was not funded. I mean, the, the, the uh, Library of Congress, Library for Congress at this time period was not initially funded uh, to Madison's disgust. It only took place later. Um, and he was uh, very disgruntled about that. So anyway, I've gone over um, systems analogous, uh, systems diagnosis and Madison's historical studies and his intensive readings during this time period. Madison also engaged in writing. Uh, he truly believed that you need to write to learn uh, as you learn to write. He, um, he, he wrote out essays that he never intended to publish. One of the things that uh, I found most interesting about Jack Rakoff's study on uh, a politician thinking is he fastens onto this and he talks about how you can catch Madison thinking in uh, the context of his writings. Uh, and his, these are his private writings, things that are not in necessarily intended for uh, public consumption. Uh, this is not his formal writings as Publius, which everybody studies. These are more vices of the political system in the United States and the uh, notes on confederation. And so um, writing these things out, he does this with money first, and then he does it with a number of different things. He takes also note, extensive notes for speeches that he writes, uh, and he's very detailed about what he's going to say. All of these things... Um, are, are, um, are a part of this process of informing himself, crystallizing his own views about uh, issues, and then, um, uh, and then trying to, to set up the terms in which you can persuade others. I'll finish with just an, an analysis of Madison's archival activities because I'm, I'm about to reach my, my limit. Um, at any rate, as Madison read histories and international law to understand better the character of confederations, and to be able to perform his duties as a congressman, he also became an archivist and a historian toward these same ends and to provide materials that would um, uh, inform others. 
Um, he forms these committees that I talked about. But he also, in 1782, begins to take notes of debates in the Continental Congress of 1782 and 1783. And then he returns to the Confederation Congress in 1787, and he takes notes in it as well. Um, at the same time, Madison uh, formulates a plan to write a civil history of the American Revolution, or perhaps leave a documentary record uh, with the same effect. Um, he has Jefferson acting as a liaison for him. They begin to gather materials for that, product, uh, that project. As the editors of the Madison Papers have said, Madison's publication project stimulated J, uh, James Madison's lifelong penchant for note-taking. So it is in the context of writing this history or providing this documentary record that he begins to take notes. He wants to leave a record for posterity um, in order to have them be able to understand uh, what they were doing. One of the things that most disgust him is the inadequacy of the records that he can um, consult regarding ancient confederacies. He doesn't think that there's been enough good ancient history written uh, in order for him to understand the confederation form. He wants future Americans to be able to look back um, when they look back at the American founding and understand um, what was going on then. He does that, in my estimation, from the very beginning of this process. He's taking notes in the Confederation Congress and um, at the Constitutional Convention for this purpose, in addition to his strategic purposes. Now, uh, my support for that is, um, is more extensive than I have time to fully document, but here are a couple of activities he engages in in his archival uh, capacity. He, um, he, takes, he asked Thomas Jefferson if he has any notes of the debate surrounding the Declaration of Independence. Jefferson supplies him with those notes that includes notes um, that are about the creation of the Articles of Confederation, not as many of those. Um, what, uh, Jefferson famously has in there his own draft of the Declaration of Independence separated from the Declaration of Independence as it is uh, eventually um, ratified by Congress in order to establish uh, his pride in his own product uh, of authorship. Um, he takes the notes on debates at the Confederation Con uh, um, Congress. He transcribes along with a clerk, a draft of the Declaration of Independence. He wants to make sure that there's a record of the Declaration of Independence uh, that he has in his hands. Um, he also, uh, and incidentally, um, urges other people to make copies of the things that they have so that those things will be preserved for posterity. He's always telling Jefferson, make a copy of this or somebody else. And later on, much later on in his retirement, historian after historian present themselves to him. And they say, um, you know, can you help me with this? Jared Sparks is the person he really fastens on to most, uh, uh, most soundly. Um, anyway, he, he finds him to be a very talented historian. Um, and he wants them to, he helps these historians and he provides them with access to his materials. Uh, and he also uh, wants them to copy things. He, he goes in during his retirement also, and he starts to retrieve all of his own personal correspondence from this time period. It's been sent to other people. He wants it back. He gets a lot of it back. Uh, there's some rare exceptions. Um, unsurprisingly, he's unable to get uh, things from William Wirt, who's writing on Patrick Henry, and Henry and Madison have never liked each other. I don't know if that's one of the reasons, but he doesn't get them back from him. But a couple of other things about this. Um, there are a number of things that are odd, odd kind of odd, oddities in the Madison corpus that are documented on the Library of Congress site. They have photographs of them, uh, but they're not in the Madison papers. And I think they're actually a part, some of them, and I think I can show this, of um, their undated collections and manuscripts that were originally, I believe, part of his plan for a book. So Madison takes notes on the Articles of Confederation. So um, that document that is notes on the Articles of Confederation includes an annotated history of the Articles of Confederation. Uh, it includes a draft of uh, Franklin's draft of the Articles of Confederation, various comments on debates 
taken from the journals of the Continental Congress, including some speeches by James Wilson. Uh, this is compiled, uh, the Madison, the editors of the Madison papers, I think, are, are you know, when I approached J.J.A. Stagg about this, um, he said that his former editors had dated this uh, as a, a product of the 1830s. Um, Stagg thinks it's probably much earlier, and I definitely think he took these notes much earlier, maybe in, uh, in the early 1780s, uh, early 1780s. Um, Madison has another kind of odd document. It's called Independence in the Constitution of Virginia, uh, in which he is basically trying to reestablish how the Constitution of Virginia came about, and also about how Virginia came uh, to declare independence because uh, Virginia's uh, uh, call for independence was so important to the nation. Uh, and he, he writes in one letter to, um, uh, to a correspondent, uh, he wants to know whether it is actually true. I think it's uh, the lawyer with, is that how you pronounce his name? Anyway, the, uh, um, his famous um, mentor in, in law, he, he asked him, is, is it really true that Patrick Henry was saying all these things and was really that advanced with regard to the revolution? Anyway, he, he, he compiles these. The final thing I'll say, um, and then I'll, uh, I'll just sit back and uh, I won't complete this. I, I, I've only gotten one third of the way through it. But anyway, the final thing I'll say is that I think the document that is entitled A Sketch Never Finished Nor Applied, that is treated as Madison's preface to the debates in the Constitutional Convention, is actually an essay that he wrote in response to a prompt from Noah Webster in 1804 asking him to chart um, the lead up to the Constitutional Convention. The, um, the document itself works so well as a preface to the, uh, to the Constitutional Convention by talking about the various efforts at union that, um, that were uh, contemplated in the American experience up in this time period. That, um, that the scholars took it, uh, actually Henry Gilpin took it uh, and put it into um, the, uh, the Gilpin volume of the papers of James Madison uh, and treated it as a preface. He wrote preface on it. Well, you know what James Madison did? He crossed out preface and he wrote a sketch never finished nor applied uh, uh, over the top of that to, to, uh, to title it. Um, and it was a sketch of the history of efforts at Union up until this time period. And I just don't think it is originally intended as a preface. When Dolly Madison turns over the papers of James Madison to, uh, to Congress, um, she describes this document as one that might be seen or something like that uh, as a preface. And so does John C. Payne. Uh, her brother, who has been one of his anemnesis. And um, he, they both describe it in terms that suggest it is their idea that it can serve as a, as a preface. To the final thing, uh, James Madison is, um, it, James Madison finally, in, in the end, his, his book is never written, but the documentary history that he wanted to provide is provided in the Gilpin edition to Madison's papers. The Gilpin edition to Madison's papers include the, the notes of Thomas Jefferson on the Declaration of Independence and the Confederation. Uh, they include Madison's notes on Congress. Then they include a selection of letters uh, that James Madison chose, uh, no one else chose them, uh, that illustrate the formation of the Constitution. So Madison delivered in effect what he thought was his didactic lesson for how uh, the American Republic um, should be thought of, his lesson for posterity uh, through the Gilpin edition. He did so because very late in his life, he came to believe two things. One, he was too debilitated to write the history he had originally uh, uh, formed. His, he had uh, very highly arthritic hands uh, during this time period. He had ha have other people write for him. But the most important reason I think he did this uh, is and he describes this to a lever in a letter to Everett, Everett, <coughs> Ed Edward Everett. Um, anyway, he describes how no one who participated in these events should be the person who writes these history, this history. So where is he back at? He's back at impartiality. No person should be a judge in their own cause. 
As it turns out, no historian should be a judge in his own cause. There you go. So he never finished his dissertation. <laughs> no. <laughs> it this says, Madison, when are you going to get out the book? Well, thank, thank you, Alan. Uh, so, well, I have a, I have a question. I guess I should, I guess I'll just go ahead. I have a couple, we have some questions, people, people might have asked questions and obviously we just, we, we, we don't have all, a, a huge amount of time, but um, I was wondering if the two of you could talk to each other, if you could talk to each other a little bit, if, since Madison uh, wanted to read, you know, he wanted there to be better historians. Right, and, and what would Madison say if he'd read the, all the historians who had the access to the records? Would he be a Neo-Garrisonian or a Neo-Lincolnian? Neo Go ahead, Michael. <laughs> Either one of you. That's just, well, I, I actually argue that um, he'd be neither. I mean, that his, the perspective that I tried to lay out in kind of sketch form uh, this afternoon. Um, I call it in another in, a, in another paper I've written, Neo Madisonian, that that is the perspective that he would have he would have called attention to the federalism driven uh, provisions that that was the central thing at issue. So uh, I, I think he would have um, he would have said that the both the Neo Garrisonians and the Neo Lincolnians perhaps emphasize slavery more than it in fact um, deserved in the, uh, or more than was warranted by the way in which slavery actually figured into the making of the constitution. That it, it figured in really only because there were certain places where there were spillover effects. So what I, th those were three places where there's spillover effects. There were things that required some account of slavery to be made, but wherever they could avoid it, they did. And so he wouldn't um, he he wouldn't give slavery quite as much prominence, I think, as either of those uh, points of view tend to do. So he'd call it neo madisonian Okay. So that was I mean, when you said that, that he would respond about federal that would about federalism it made me think, oh well, he's he, he would have he would have liked Peter Ona. But... Of course, he would like Peter Ona. Yeah, of course. Well, that would, which is very appropriate <laughs> considering the Virginia connection. Alan, did you have any anything to add to that? Or? Um, no, this is Michael's wheelhouse, but I'll, I'll just say that uh, during his retirement, Madison comes up with all of the stuff. He becomes basically, he, he comes clean as basically a Jeffersonian uh, with regard to the, the issue of slavery, a conditional anti-slavery person. Uh, he's the president of the Co uh, American Colonization Society, all those kinds of things. He, he talks in some detail about a plan for um, expatriation of slaves. Um, of enslaved peoples to other lands. Um, he also directly deals with the constitutional questions of the, uh, the extent to which um, the, uh, the importation and migration clause should apply to interstate uh, trafficking of slaves as opposed uh, to international trafficking of slaves. And he says it was never meant to forbid uh, interstate trafficking of slaves. Um, uh, that's, you know, he's been, by that time, he's acting as the originalist uh, with regard to these kinds of, uh, of issues. Now, could, could I just add in, in response to what Ellen just said that um, I don't mean to say that Madison was like neutral or indifferent about the slavery question. That is, he had some quite outspoken um, uh, statements about slavery. He tended, personally anyway, he was quite opposed to it. Um, so uh, m my point is mainly, how, what does it have to do with the making of the Constitution, not, no, not what it is in itself, uh, which is, well, from his point of view, a somewhat different issue. Yeah. Okay, well, let's, let's start. I've got some, got, got, a, uh, got, got a cue going, though I'm, I'm, do, I'm gonna be using moderators uh, prerogative of trying to get them in an interesting order. So let's go to David Wallstreicher from City, City University, all the way from New York City. Play all the way from Philadelphia. Yeah, I know. I know. I was just, you know, all the way from New York City. That's how it's, that's what it. <laughs> okay, I'm I'm going to uh, I'm gonna. Uh, m these were both both wonderful and got got me thinking uh, on topics I'm always glad to return to. 
and at the risk of being a little bit self-referential, but uh, I'm go uh, but not in a way I think everyone will expect. Um, Mike may remember that I wrote a piece for American Political Thought that he edited about Madison, and maybe Alan uh, has read it at one point or another. It was a short essay, but I art, but it took off from some things I said in Slavery's Constitution, and I argued that um, that Madison. Uh, if you look at what Madison does with the notes, and if you look at what Madison does in the Federalist Papers, and how that he's a key mediator of this question in between the pro-slavery folks and the anti-slavery folks, that he really kind of fudges it in interesting, pragmatic ways that I think are quite compatible with both of your readings of what Madison's all about uh, and, and his function uh, uh, as an intellectual and as a politician at the time. Um, even uh, even if Jack doesn't see it, um, uh, I think it is compatible with Madisonianism and the Madisonian moment. Uh, but um, uh, and I and I even I, what I did uh, on this occasion was uh, because of the nature of the of the um, that roundtable was take it in a in a neo Beardian kind of way to suggest that you can actually see both a lot of idealism and and materialism in Madison in which he realizes that slavery is a question that challenges us in both those ways and is, is the problem that's connected to everything else and that it needs to be, de it needs to be dealt with in a way that's really, that's careful and subtle and that it, it, it compromises us, but it also uh, forces us to try to do better. At least that's what I tried to, to argue at the end. Um, so that was my attempt to, to arbitrate and mediate these things and not seem like the neo Garrisonian that everyone seems to want to make me out to be. <laughs> so uh, given that, uh, isn't there a problem with seeing Madison as either as either as either the historian who has all the answers or as the political theorist who understands everything like I, I understand the gesture, but he's such a participant. <laughs> That isn't it like I mean I I did a version of this isn't it, can we look to him for our analysis of what's going on if he is the person who's both providing the evidence and has so many stakes in it? Um, I'll I'll start and then maybe Michael can add some things and I might want to come back in as as things uh, percolate but I uh, um, I I think that Madison faces the problem from his own. Um, I believe that the proposition that no man should be a judge in his own cause is the central ethical proposition guiding James Madison's political thought. So I feel that strongly about it. So I agree with you fundamentally that Madison faces a problem there. And the question is, how does he address that problem? How does he make his notes more impartial uh, uh, than they would otherwise have been? Um, I mean, there's been all kinds of studies done. Mary Builder talks about this, about how incomplete those records must be because, you know, if you measure the number of words that the speakers do in, a, in an hour and you look at the notes on the convention, you see it's a very, it has to be an absolute fraction of the, uh, the, the speeches um, t t talked about. Um, Madison makes a number of maneuvers, I think, uh, to establish his, his impartiality. One of the things he does is try to collect the speeches from the people who gave them. Uh, he does this with regard to uh, um, Alexander Hamilton. There's a big controversy about, about that later. Hamilton says he never, um, he was never aboard a, uh, a lifetime executive. Madison says he was in his notes. Uh, they supposedly secured from Hamilton do that. Um, I think it's Franklin's speech that he gets from a publication. Um, he does all kinds of things with the journal itself, which is a mess. The journal of the convention uh, is an absolute mess. Um, Madison corrects parts of it. He's, he's a student enough to know how to correct it. He integrates it into um, his, uh, his account of the Constitutional Convention. Um, I think he is engaged in a good faith effort to provide a fair record of what other people are saying, including himself. I don't see a tremendous amount of evidence uh, that he later integrated things that, um, uh, that made him seem more important uh, or that changed his thoughts that he had at that time period. 
I do think that there's the possibility of things like one of his speeches looks an awful lot like vices of the political system of the United States. And I think he's, there's a possibility. He, of course, he can't take notes and um, of speeches he's making at the same time. So he's got to go back and reconstruct them. How does he reconstruct them? He might have gone to uh, something like vices of the political system of the United States. Where Mary Builder has, Mary Builder's big score is in this uh, so-called uh, part of it, what she call it, the, um, I can't believe, I can't think of it, uh, of it. it's an archeological term for uh, a, a, a piece of the puzzle that's out of place in time from, uh, from, uh, from this. Um, anyway, it, it's clear that Madison could not have taken the notes the way he, he took them uh, before integrating the journal before 1790 or so. So he, he does go and get the journal and the final, I think it's third or fourth of the debates in the Constitutional Convention have the journal integrated directly into it. Um, the other parts he later has to add them to it. To it. Um, so um, there is, there's reason to suspect that that was not done immediately after the Constitutional Convention, as he said, within two finishing days, I think is the phrase he used, but, but came along a couple of years later. I think that she had, no one has, has provided an explanation of that part of um, the, the notes that, um, that does uh, an adequate job of, um, of explaining how he was able to get all of the information he was able to get during that time period. So, um, I mean, you're, you're addressing really for me a different question than audience here. You're, des you're addressing the issue of authenticity and integrity and other things about the notes. And, and I separate them conceptually and I haven't spent the time on the one that I've spent on the other. Uh, so my, my mind may change about this, but for right now, I think, there's, I think the, the, the debates are a fair account of what was done. Um, let's see, oh, David, I want to say hello. Um, I remember our conversations uh, fondly in DCO snack bar back when you were at Notre Dame and how nice that was uh, to have you as a colleague. Um, I, I find your question um, interesting. Um, I mean, as I take it is, does, is, is Matt, can Madison or can any participant be objective enough that we should take his his analysis of what happened as true. Is that a fair, a fair restatement of your? I was trying, I guess I was trying to pose the question in a way that addressed both, addressed my, how it yeah. overlaps with, with each, with each of your distinct papers and projects. I, I could, yes, I could reframe it though. What do you, I, I, we could reframe it. We could do Occam's razor and I could say, what do you think of Federalist 54? you know, these days in light of, in light of all this, where he yeah. could be a southerner and says, oh, it's not that bad. And look, I'm not, we're not, we're not as bad as these guys. Yeah. Uh, well, Federal 54, I, I see is largely a, a, an important piece of rhetoric. I mean, he has to win everybody's support for the constitution and, and he puts forward a kind of half-baked argument that he, that he hopes might have some bad effect. Um, I, I mean, to, to address your more general, the more general question, at least as I rephrased it, um, first of all, what I presented as a Madison, neo-Madisonian position isn't actually an analysis he gave. I mean, what I tried to do was to say, how does the Constitution look as Madison was working on it and as he, uh, as he, I think, understood it? And how would you understand the slavery provisions in it, starting from that kind of perspective? That's what I was trying to present. And then the, the second question would be, well, can we take that as objective or true? And I would say, well, that's a sort of empirical question. I mean, it depends. Sometimes, yes, probably. And some, sometimes, yes, he could be taken as, as a good explanation. Sometimes not. In this case, I happen to think this is a pretty accurate account, uh, acceptable account that broader kind of research would, would support. Uh, I'll, just, I'll just mention it. It seems like you're, you're closer to where I am than, say, than Jack Rakoff is when Jack says that, oh, when Madison says that the real issue here, uh, when we're talking about, about, about big states, small, we're really talking about big states, small states. And the real problem is, the real problem is North, is North and South that he was really just, the, Jack says he's just trying to change the subject. You would say, look, federalism is the real issue here. 
I'm saying yeah. that look, I'm saying, well, wait a minute, like, wait a minute, maybe it really is about maybe federalism is about slavery also, or at least it's not in for Americans, it's not separable from that. It never even hardly it can re, can we really say it even pre-exists it. So I'm not saying that it's really slavery. Slavery doesn't exist outside of federalism in any kind of American political thinking or action. Um, but I'm uh, you know, it's well, I mean, I don't know. That's a, that seems to me debatable. I mean, it, it's. Uh, I mean, they were interrelated. You know, in a, yes, they were interrelated in a way that was obviously important. But um, I think they were interested in federalism for reasons other than slavery. I guess if that's. I mean, I don't know if you mean to be saying something different from that, but that seems to me their interest in federalism was actually not, not about, not primarily about slavery. Um. Uh, I don't know. I'm going to have to think about that. Okay. Well, I'd like to hear what other me too. I'll, I'll, I'll think, think about, about it. About it. You, can, you guys can, you can, we can, we can get into it more deeply okay. after yeah. the, we turn yeah. the yeah. recording off if you, if you all like, because we should get a few more of these questions in. And usually, usually I make this big thing about we have how we ask, let student ask the first question too late. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, Riley Messer, would you like to be the first student to ask a question? Yes, thank you so much for this um, talk. And my question is for Professor Gibson. So um, your discussion about James Madison and specifically Madison as sort of a historian and an archivist got me thinking about um, other framers and um, sort of their, um, their note-taking procedures as well. And I got to thinking about specifically Thomas Jefferson. You know, he left very meticulously curated notes, but he seems much more interested in maintaining his public legacy versus it seems to, that you're making the argument that Madison is a bit more concerned with archiving bigger pictures, ide bigger picture ideas and events of the time period. And he's less concerned with preserving his own personal image. So do you think that's a fair comparison of the two or did Madison sort of have um, maybe personal motivations uh, for keeping these extensive notes as well? I don't know. Um... I don't know Jefferson well enough to know, um, you know, the, the his motives. Uh, it's interesting that you, the phraseology you used um, that he's interested in is. I guess you're saying he's interested in his public reputation. Therefore, it is about Jefferson as a person that he is concerned, and Madison is really more about the record of the Republic itself. I think that's the distinction you're making, Madison. Um, Madison destroys almost everything that has, uh, is about his private life um, that he can. Um, he has this um, affair with the kid, well, well, not affair, he is, he's dating a, a, an incredibly young woman at one point uh, who uh, breaks up with him. Uh, he does everything he can do to, to erase the record of his thoughts on that. Um, he, he doesn't allow anything about his own personal religious beliefs um, to follow uh, in his in his uh, in his correspondence throughout his life, he is definitely uh, very guarded, and he doesn't he just doesn't believe uh, that it is um, that that's what should be on uh, on the table. I think um, that he believes he believes the the public record is out there, uh, and that's what he should be judged on, and the records he's trying to keep are ones that are a record of a broad legacy of the Jeffersonians. Um, is, is his record, is his selection of, of letters, for example, in the Gilpin edition, uh, are other aspects of this tilted in a Jeffersonian way? I mean, how could they be anything but that, right? I mean, he, he's, but they're not tilted because he believes um, they represent um, one partisan view, and that's the view that he um, he had, and it's uh, you know, and that's the only one to be preserved. He believes that that's the truth, as far as I can see. I mean, he re he really believes that the uh, you know the Jeffersonian legacy is the one uh, worthy of being carried forward, and I, I I I think probably Thomas Jefferson doesn't disagree with that at all. So I, I would suggest to you that his um, his record uh, that he leaves is very groomed. I, I don't have any problem with that, but it is within an 18th, you have to understand it within an 18th century understanding 
of what fame and reputation and all of those other kinds of concepts that, again, Adair taught us about really meant. I, I mean, he is... Um, he believes that if the, the public record is looked at, that people will understand um, what they did and why they did it. And he, I don't think he ever says it like this, but I believe he believes that they'll be vindicated, that the founders will be vindicated. So it sounds to me like in a certain way, Madison, Madison is more concerned about his public image than Jefferson. Uh, at least, at least in terms, at least in terms of the keeping the scrubbing, because Jefferson probably did try that, but it didn't didn't work nearly as well, clearly. Um, so we have a couple more. All right, we're just out. You know, this is in the spirit of one of Michael's classes, by the way. Uh, <laughs> I've even taken any Allen's classes, but I suspect it might be the same. So we're just like. Uh, we're, we're, we'll, 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 we'll wrap it up here soon. We're going to go a little over, let, let us, let us, let us go a few minutes over. Uh, got about three more questions here. Uh, Connor Ewing. Right. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Our colleague, uh, Connor you. Ewing, of you. Uh, thank you, Michael and Alan. This is great. I wanted to go back to the federalism concern that, that David raised. Mm -hmm. I think taking a slightly different direction. I was struck, uh, Michael, when you said that a precondition for the extension of the federal principle, so the unmediated relationship between the central mm -hmm. government uh, and citizens was a clear demarcation between state and federal powers. Mm -hmm. uh, my question, I think in the shortest form is what exactly does that understanding of political power require or entail? Because it's not clear to me that such an understanding uh, was accepted by the constitution's framers, uh, at, certainly not all of them. Uh, and not the most consequential ones. So I think thinking of, of Publius, uh, Federalist 37 alone on the part, proper line of partition, you have Hamilton's arguments throughout the Federalist Papers, Madison's correspondence, uh, other founders as well. I was happy that I saw that Jonathan Gynap is here. Uh, this is drawing on some of his work. People like Wilson and Gouverneur Morris as well seem to reject the, the general thrust of this. And then certainly in the anti-Federalist concern about uh, consolidation, I think the, uh, that understanding of at least of enumerated powers was much more so a post founding development, one very much rooted in debates over slavery uh, and economic policy. But maybe it's just that I'm not fully capturing or understanding what you mean by this clear demarcation between uh, state and national. So that's, that's the question. Okay, uh, yeah, good. Um, this is an issue on which Madison himself, of course, vacillated a bit um, both at the convention and at least some would argue after the convention. Um, so at the beginning of the convention in the Virginia plan, Madison had written in or the Virginia delegates had written in a kind of very general term for granting congressional power. And Madison at that time said that he would favor an enumeration, but he wasn't sure it could be done. But then they worked on it and it seemed to, it, get, it got done. It might be, as Madison admits in Federalist 37 and as uh, history shows, it might be that this enumeration is never going to be perfect. But I believe that Madison actually at the convention and in Federalist papers accepted that this was what the Constitution actually did provide for and that the, the um, how should we say, the expansiveness of the enumerated powers as developed, let's say, in Hamilton's uh, mind, um, was an illegitimate uh, extension of the Constitution. And that Madison, from the, the somewhere in the middle of the Constitutional Convention on, was in fact committed to the enumerated powers as a pretty clear line of demarcation between the two. Um, I have a paper that I, is going to be published. No, it's just, it's actually already been published in a, in a, collection on, Marber, on uh, McCulloch v. Maryland, in which I try to um, um, defend Madison's vision of the necessary and proper clause against, on the one side, the Jeffersonian, and on the other side, the Hamiltonian. And uh, I would maintain that, that uh, this idea that the enumerated powers did divide powers reasonably well was not a not a late development, but was in fact the understanding from pretty much from the outset of most of them, not obviously all of them. Hey, Connor, do you do you have any follow? You did you 
I will let others. I'll let others give okay, their. Okay, well, we have we have another student question from uh, Dominic Torno. Uh, hi, is my mic working? I had some. Is it is you're there. Okay. Yeah. Um. So some of uh, James Madison's contemporaries, such as Alexander Hamilton, um, accused him of changing his policy positions in order to, among other things, gain better political standing, uh, viewing him as becoming more Jeffersonian um, mm -hmm. due to a number of influences. Uh, do you agree with these accusations or do you think that there is a, Madison has a um, ideological consistency throughout the time period of the early Republic? Are you asking me or are you asking Alan? Or both? Um, the are question's open. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll, 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 I'll try. I think both Alan and I maybe uh, pretty much agree on on this issue. Um, uh, I think Madison is much more consistent than he's been normally. I think there are there are some changes, but I would see them more as nuanced than uh, as major shifts. Um, part, one of the reasons is what I just said about the enumerated powers that I think from the moment the constitution was written, Madison was committed to the enumerated powers and not to this very expansive notion of federal power. Um, uh, and I think part of the issue has to do with a overestimation of Madison's nationalism at the time of the convention. I don't think the evidence really supports that. Maybe Connor has that view as, as well, and that may be where he and I are disagreeing about this. Yellen, to you. Um, yeah, I, I agree with that for the most part. I think that there are broad, broad swaths of, uh, of consistency with regard uh, to, to Madison, especially in the issue of political economy, which is one of the things that's not focused on enough when you talk about James Madison. Madison's plan to, um, to implement uh, restrictions against British commerce in order to uh, get the navigation acts in effect um, uh, eliminated, to get the, the system of, uh, of restrictions on commerce of America um, alleviated. This is what he believes um, the revolution has been fought for in part. Uh, and he is absolutely consistent in uh, trying to implement that. And that goes all the way up to explaining the war of 1812 to some degree. Um, I think with regard to federal state issues and things like that, I, I basically agree with uh, Michael because I agree with Michael's characterization of the universal veto as essentially a negative, uh, as a veto power, not a, uh, a positive enforcement power. And I think that that's a very important distinction. And I would urge you to, uh, to think about, it, uh, about that if you believe Madison is fundamentally inconsistent. I, I will say this, and that is that I think that Madison is inconsistent with regard to what he goes into the Constitutional Convention and what he comes out with, but then he accepts what he comes out with. That is actually Madison's own narrative too, though. Uh, I mean, the, the loss of the universal veto, uh, he makes very little commentary on it the rest of his life. In a sketch ne never finished nor applied, he refers to it, uh, and, he, and he calls it an impractical idea. He suggests that it was a good thing that was knocked down. Um, but um, its loss immediately uh, has a profound effect on him. He, he deeply, he thinks that the constitution won't work uh, without the universal veto for a very short period of time. Uh, and then he just goes silence on that, uh, on that issue. He writes the Federalist Papers. And then in, in his narrative of how things spun out, he's the one that accepts the constitution as it was um, ratified. And Hamilton is the one who tries to administrate it into something that it was never intended to be. Okay, um, I, I guess I just can't see things a whole lot differently than that because I've been inside Madison's writings for so long. But I, I just think that there's a basic truth to that. That that Hamilton is. Uh, it, it's it's just like. Uh, Hamilton has a certain nature and you can't keep that nature from coming through. And, and, and he wants um, a very, very strong federal government. Uh, and, and so he'll use administration in order to achieve that goal. That doesn't uh, um, um, strike me as, a, as an improper charge by Madison. That, that doesn't strike me as something going against Madison's character, uh, Hamilton's character, something like that. I, I mean, Madison didn't go his way to, uh, to accuse Ma uh, Hamilton of, bad, of having a bad character, um, at least by the time he got into his retirement. He he, Hamilton claimed all of the federal papers virtually. Uh, Madison had a list and knew which one he, were, was whose. Uh, and um, mm -hmm. Madison said, basically, um, I just think he made a mistake. Uh, and he, and he, you know, uh, he, he wouldn't say he tried to grab my writings or something like that. He, 
he, he didn't do that kind of thing. That's well, just so what would so what would you what would you Alan and Michael what would you say to say Hamilton? I mean, because that's one of the people I think Dominic's probably talking about who thought that Madison had been inconsistent, right? I mean, I, I mean, accepting that you you got all the experts, so you're certainly correct that there's some that it all fits together from Madison's perspective. But why? How did other people get such an opposite impression? You want to go, Michael? How did other people get an opposite impression about Madison? You mean? Yeah, no. Well, I mean, I think we were reading in class something where Hamilton was very obviously very upset, and you know, if they had the term flip flopper, he would have he would have he would have applied it. He would have yeah. applied that to Madison. I, I mean, first of all, there were clear differences between Madison and Hamilton at the Constitutional Convention. So, yeah. whereas Madison, um, so both of them in their original versions and their preferred versions, let's say, of the Constitution, wanted to see the federal government intrude much, uh, intrude more deeply into the states than the final Constitution allowed. And Madison wanted to do it according to this thing Ellen mentioned. The, negative that right. Congress would have over state laws. But Hamilton wanted to do it largely by the, uh, the federal government appointing governors of the states who would have a veto power over the, uh, over the states. And he wanted to do it with a more, much more expansive grant of power to, to Congress. So in effect, Hamilton would have, uh, have the federal government have something more like a positive power to override the states, whereas Madison only allows a negative power to override the states, which is, as Alan suggested, is quite an important difference. Okay. Um, it's like the difference between the president having a veto over congressional legislation or having the legislative power himself in the sense of he can make laws. There, there's, a, there's a difference between those two kind of powers. Um, so I would say they differed right from the outset and that Hamilton, I think, over estimated, I think he misunderstood Madison from the start, that he overestimated the degree to which Madison was somewhere like on the same page with him as committed to, or at least as, as able to see that a, this kind of very strong, much stronger national power would be necessary for the system to operate. I think he mis, misunderestimated, as one of our former presidents would say, he misunderestimated how Madison thought a system a federal system of the sort he outlined could in fact operate successfully. Um, so, so I would say Hamilton and others perhaps did that. Given, given the, 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 let's say the lines of division within the Constitutional Convention itself or at that time, Madison was certainly strongly on the national side of things. So if we had to divide them up between people more nationally oriented, more federally oriented, Madison was certainly on the more nationally oriented but um, uh, he was not as national as a lot of people were, or some, pe or some people were, I should say, and as he later was interpreted to be. I think he had a more nuanced position on these matters than many of the others. You know, they, the anti-federalists tended to say, you know, you're either a nationalist or, you, or you're a federalist. Uh, so I think Madison was more nuanced and people perhaps didn't understand the nuance of his position. So if I had had the opportunity, the original opportunity to present when we got snowed out, that was going to be on the consistency of James Madison. The whole thing the presentation was going to be my take on the consistency question. Um, I'll, I'll just say a couple of things. The way that you get to the idea that Madison's inconsistent is you just look at the question of policy. So Madison was for the funding and assumption um, of the state debts, then he was against it. And he was, uh, he was, he never mentioned and didn't advocate discrimination between original and subsequent holders of the debt. Then all of a sudden he does. Um, how does that turnabout come about? Um, Madison's own explanation is, I think, valid again. Uh, once again, I, I look, when I try to figure out what Madison's up to, I look to what he says first because it turns out to work out and be logical and coherent. And with regard to both of those issues, it's a question of proportional justice that he's talking about. Um, the subsequent, with regard to the uh, subsequent holders of the debt, uh, for example, conditions have changed and the people who hold that debt are different. Uh, and uh, Madison wants to proportion out a degree of um, a benefit for the government 
uh, to the people who originally held and let go of their debt. Uh, but he thinks that that is the only just way to do this. Um, with regard to the state debts, he thinks that some states have already paid most of what uh, they should have paid or paid more than other states. And he wants to balance out the degree of contributions that have already been made against, against others. Um, I do think this is a very complex issue. And I do think that there's a Hamiltonian side to Madison in 1787. And that is um, to borrow Ma uh, Michael's language in the so-called long leash dimension of his Republicanism. Now, uh, Hamilton has even longer leashes between the citizens and, um, and the government than Madison does. Uh, but Madison is for very substantially long terms. Um, three years for representatives, I think it's seven or even nine years for senators. Um, Madison floats the idea of a life term for president at the Constitutional Convention. He says uh, in a fragment, he wrote a commentary with regard to that, that he only uh, was trying to support another delegate, McClure from Virginia, who he had argued would be a good person to be a delegate for the Constitutional Convention. And this was a way of thinking through how to create independence in the presidency. He didn't seriously entertain that, uh, um, that position. I don't know, if you look, read the letter to uh, Washington, which is one of the three letters that informs Madison's thinking prior to um, the Constitutional Convention, he says that you need almost every barrier for stability. Um, uh, the most partisan of Republicans will be for, uh, for a very high barrier of stability uh, in order to enhance uh, liberty. They will understand the relationship between those two. And the reason Madison says that is because he has a very complex understanding of the relationship of liberty and power. And it's not a, a zero sum game in his estimation. Um, liberty grows to a certain degree, then it becomes very powerful and concentrated, and then it disperses itself. He, if, you, if you wanna see this, read the Bill of Rights letter to Thomas Jefferson about this issue. Okay, thank you, Alan. So I think to what we're definitely uh, down to the last question, uh, but it's going to be a good one. So let's go out to the West Coast and Jonathan Gannett. Well, let's hope so, anyway. <laughs> um, uh, it's, it's good to see both of you, and thank you very much for, for that symposium, which was really rich and um, a pleasure to listen to. Um, so I have a question for each of you. I'll start with you, Alan. We've talked to a lot about this project. You know I'm sympathetic to it. You know I really like it. I always learn an extraordinary amount from your very subtle, insightful reading of Madison's mind. But I suppose my question um, is, is as unfair as it is simple. Uh, <laughs> why is it a sketch neither finished nor applied? If it is indeed as you want us to believe it to be, why does he never finish it? Um, he has 20 years post-presidency at Montpelier. He deals with the physical ailments that, 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 that you know, sort of beset him his whole life, but he's enormously productive during these years, especially when it comes to writing in the political and constitutional domain. I mean, his, his correspondence from that period is, is extraordinarily rich, um, could make up an entire volume in political theory. Um, so if it's not meant to be an introduction to the notes, but indeed meant to be the sort of broader uh, history, as you suggest, um, do you have any thoughts on, um, you know, productive speculation on, on why it why it doesn't exist. And and then to Michael, um, I, I, I apologize, I came a little bit late because I was running from another meeting. So if you spoke to this, um, my apologies. Um, I, I, you know, I, I found your, your sort of very subtle, you know, sort of tour guide taking us through these, these debates over slavery in the constitution extremely helpful. And they dovetail well with things you've written for many years that I've learned a great deal from on federalism. But I'm curious if I could push you to speak a bit more about um, I, I was really taken with your distinction between law and legitimacy. But if we look at the legal domain, what would you say about the supremacy clause of Article 6 or the Republican Guarantee Clause um, of Article 4? Um, if, if we're trying to settle on what the original Constitution from the standpoint of federalism was trying to do, not vis-a-vis -vis subject matter enumeration, um, Connor preempted me on that point, um, <laughs> but on sort of repugnancy and how the, when the federal government can or cannot step in on domestic lawmaking that um, is taken to be repugnant to the federal 
Constitution. Um, I, can, I can imagine what Madison might say, but it seems as though there are a variety of people at the convention who have a more capacious understanding of how this might work that could potentially have allowed the federal government to reach slavery in ways that certainly would have been controversial, but are arguably on the table um, in those early years. So I was asked the first question, so I, I guess I'll, I'll respond first. Uh, and um, so I would turn you to uh, Madison's correspondence with Noah Webster. Um, it's October 12, 1804. And Webster has asked him for certain facts about the founding. Um, and Madison is, says that he uh, is replying. And then he says, I'm afraid that the sketch will fall far short of the object of your letter. Under more favorable uh, circumstances, I might make it more particular. Uh, I've often had the idea to make out from the materials in my hands and within my reach as minute a chronicle as I can of the origin and progress of the last revolution in our government. I went through that task with respect to the Declaration of Independence and the old Confederation whilst a member of Congress in 1783, availing myself of the circumstances to be gleaned from the public archives and of some auxiliary circumstances to trace in a like manner a chronicle or rather a history of our present constitution would in several points of view still be more curious and interesting. And fortunately the materials are for it are far more extensive whether I shall ever to be able to make such a contribution to the annals of our country is rendered every day more and more uncertain. Um, so that, in my opinion, is the origin of the sketch. My first answer to your um, to, to your problem, the problem you posed, is it's originally intended as a sketch. It's not originally intended comprehensive in the first place. Uh, he fulfills it as a sketch. Um, but also in terms of just why didn't he ever get it done, there's a lot of things he didn't get done. I mean, he did get a lot of things done, right? But then there's, there's all these other things he, did, he doesn't get done. He, um, he's toying with this idea of writing um, sort of an autobiography par uh, partly of himself uh, when Paulding approaches him, uh, James K. Paulding, uh, and that's what becomes his autobiography or whatever. He completes things like that in that fashion in the end of his life, and um, you know, he he even in 1804 he's crying old age, uh, and that's part of what he's saying. And then um, you know later on he then adopts this idea of impartiality, and so um, you know I don't know what the impartiality has necessarily to do with tracing the events up to the Constitutional uh, Convention uh, in a more comprehensive form. I guess he I think he could have done that. Had, had, had he wanted to, but he doesn't complete the whole history because he doesn't believe that he's the right person um, to do it. And, and again, I think, I think he completed the part that he said he would complete. I, in the quote that I, in the paragraph I read that's very important to me, uh, you note the relationship between the materials he's gathered on the Declaration of Independence, uh, the materials he's, the notes he's taken on the Confederation Congress, and uh, this other broad project he had to the project in the convention itself. Um, and that's, um, again, part of my, my reason uh, for believing what I believe about this. Um, okay, I'll, I was asked the second question, so I'll try to answer that. Um, so uh, you, you ask about two, two powers uh, or two parts, provisions of the constitution that might be held to empower the federal government to somehow act against slavery in the states. That's how I understood your question. So first with regard to the supremacy clause. So the supremacy clause says that uh, all valid laws and treaties of the US government are supreme over state laws, constitutions, et cetera. But the issue is what, what, valid, what are the valid laws of the federal government? And I think there were referred back to the enumerated powers and I don't see any enumerated power that even begins to give a power over slavery. The second issue is about Republican government. And here, this is an interesting provision because it is one of the very few places in the constitution where something about the internal character of the state governments is, or state uh, uh, regimes, so to speak, is in fact provided for. Now, so I'd, I'd say two points about that. So first, um, this, was a, this was a point of federal theory as Montesquieu developed it, which was very influential at, at the time. 
and he said that he said uh, uh, that a successful and a successful federation requires that all the members be of the same type of regime and ideally republic and so they took that over i think they had that uh, they they were persuaded by that then the second question is well is republic consistent with slavery and i think the answer for them would be yes it was the historical um, record showed that most many if not all republics in history had been in fact uh, had slavery um, and therefore the existence of slavery in itself was not a violation of republicanism it might have been it's a violation of other things but it's not a violation of republicanism and even madison's much more democratic definition of republic um, would allow it seems to me is consistent with having slavery that is where the political power has a source in the great body of the people rather than in a select few and so you say well that's still even virginia even south carolina satisfies that requirement so that would be the the two things i think that i would say and i think madison would probably agree okay well so uh I, I there were there were a couple of stu couple of students who I who actually still had a question they did I, one of which I missed and another came in last we guess have time for one more we sort of group question they're sort of related I know it's been a while we've been on a long time yeah all right Abby Abby Smith you want to come on and ask yours okay so my question is for Dr Zuckert um, thanks so much for this impactful discussion. Um, if the main concern of the Supreme Court is upholding the Constitution, wouldn't their decision on the Dred Scott case further endorse the Constitution as a pro-slavery document? Or would this be another example of the Supreme Court attempting to keep slavery within the jurisdiction of the state? And I know uh, Kira also has kind of a follow-up question. So yeah, she does. Thank you. you. Kira, come on. Yeah, you want to come up and ask for us too. Yeah, it's a good idea, Abby. I, I, I agree with that. I think my, I mean, my question kind of goes off of that idea of the language, um, just kind of saying uh, if the Constitution doesn't outright recognize slavery, but simultaneously protects it in certain ways, um, I'm just wondering how that also works into the formula of it being legal, but not legit. Okay. Uh, all right. So the um, the Supreme Court and Dred Scott. So what I, what I what I um, uh, argue about the Dred Scott case is a sort of extension of what I said here today. That is that what was going on during the antebellum period was this struggle between legitimacy and legality, and that there were a variety of different attempts to bring them more into harmony with each other. One of which was the abolitionism, as I said, try to make legality conform to legitimacy. But the other was the attempt to reconstruct legitimacy to make it conform with the legality, the illegal existence of slavery. And I, it seems to me that the Dred Scott case is a case where the court actually succumbed to the temptation to try to make legitimacy uh, conform rather to the legality of slavery. And therefore, it breaks out of the, the formula that I gave you for what slavery was in the original constitution. That is, it was an attempt to make slavery much stronger. And Lincoln, you know, Lincoln um, in his analysis of the Dred Scott case, I think showed that the Dred Scott case in fact implied, the Dred Scott case in fact implied that slavery would be legal everywhere in the United States, that the states would not have the power to forbid slavery. So I would say there was a clear case where um, uh, the court is uh, stepping outside the boundaries of what the Constitution originally provided. Now, maybe that's a shock to you, but um, you know, that's, what I, that's what I suspect they did. Um, now, Clara, your question, the language of the Constitution, maybe you can restate it. So maybe I can get a better handle on it. You're, Sorry, you're no, muted. Hey. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think what I was basically curious about was um, just the fact that we talk about how there's a not, they're not saying slavery, they're not outright talking about slavery within the Constitution, right. but there's this um, mission to protect it all the same. And I'm just wondering about how this protection kind of works into the idea of it being illegitimate or um, whether it matters or not. 
No, I don't think they were attempting to protect it. They were attempting to um, um, uh, make provision for it everywhere where they absolutely had to, but not to protect it. The Confederate Constitution attempted to protect it. It said no state shall forbid slavery. That's protecting slavery. That we don't see any like anything like that in the U.S. Constitution, and uh, nothing. I, I I don't think anything actually that is in the Constitution could be understood to be protection of slavery. Maybe the fugitive slave clause. But I tried to explain that I think the better way to understand that is in terms of federalism. That is, you're right. you're just trying to minimize frictions among the states. So that that's how it that's how it give your. Okay, answer. so there's no, yeah, no sense of protection, and so it doesn't work into it. Okay, yeah, great. Yeah, okay, yeah, thanks. Okay, well, you know, we could all, this we, this discussion obviously will uh, continue, but I yeah. think uh, Michael and Alan have been on for like two hours, uh, so <laughs> I think we should give them a big virtual hand right now. And uh, as, <laughs> as usual, uh, we're going to turn off that we're going to turn off the recording now, so goodbye.